Okay, so hi everyone, this is Sean Mullery from Electronic Engineering at IT Sligo and in tonight's lecture we're going to look at modelling the, the cameras. This is obviously part of our multi-view geometry and computer vision. Um, so firstly, kind of uh, hi Niall, uh, you're very welcome. Um, so firstly, we're going to just quickly mention orthographic projection, although uh, a bit like the, you know, you know which is a, a, a version of the parallel projection that we looked at uh, in, in the previous class. Um, we're not that interested in it, but I'm going to mention where it might be useful here uh, in terms of uh, camera views. So this is fairly simple. If your projection is from the origin of the world um, 3D coordinates, then to find the 2D projection, you just drop the third coordinate. Now, you might say, well, okay, that's fine if our camera is at the origin of the world coordinates. How does that happen? Well, normally what we would do is we would, uh, and you'll see this later, we would um, move our coordinate system so that it is at, uh, at the camera so that we can then work from there um, or otherwise, um, you know, we have, we have to work relative to something else. Um, so if you do that, then all you have to do is remove a coordinate and you're done. Okay. Um, however, this is of limited use as cameras don't really work this way. So uh, there are telecentric lenses that do so, uh, and uh, I know very little about them, but um, there are telecentric lenses that, that will kind of give you this view of things. Um, but they're, they're an unusual uh, oddity rather than something that you're going to see on, on, on cars. Um, but it can be a good approximation of your camera position uh, or if your camera position is far away. So if you're dealing with uh, situations such as a telephoto lens um, where you're looking over a long distance, this can be very useful. But again, in terms of our autonomous vehicles, the idea of a, of a telephoto lens where you have a very small, um, you, you know, um, view in, in what's in front of you, that's unlikely to be particularly useful um, because it can't see anything off to the side and so on. So um, while we do do certainly have front mounted cameras, it's on, it would be unlikely that we would have them as telephoto. And even telephoto are not perfectly orthographic projections, but they're, they're not far off it. Okay. So generally speaking, we move on from those and we look at the perspective projection or, uh, or the pinhole camera model. Now, if you've ever seen an actual pinhole camera, they're, they're just a very simplistic thing. They're just a box with a little, uh, a small little pinhole in them. Um, and they will they will produce um, they'll produce an image at the back of the box uh, of what is outside uh, what is outside the box uh, with the with the light rays coming through them. Um, that said, it's it, it's hard to demonstrate them because you can't get your head inside the box. But you can actually do this uh, by um, blackening out a, a room, generally a south facing room or something like that. So black out the windows, black out everything else, and then just put a small hole. Um, in whatever you've used to uh, to black out the windows, and it'll be very it'll be very dim, but you will actually see an image forming, uh, an image of whatever is outside your house or your or your office or whatever. You'll see that forming uh, on the walls. Okay, so that's the pinhole idea. Uh, it's very useful in terms of us working through the maths of the model. Um, but when it comes to actual cameras, we need a lens that will actually gather light together and focus it. So gather lots of light together and focus it rather than just dealing with a small pinhole, which does that job. But that said, um, the thin lens models and so on would all work on a very similar, similar principle to this. So uh, we won't get bogged down with that in this, in this uh, module. We'll deal with it as if it's a, a, a pinhole camera. And later on, I will mention some distortions and so on that you can have in lenses, um, but we'll worry about that when we get there. So the pinhole camera model and similarly the thin lens model work on the principle of similar triangles. So similar triangles meaning that the angles in the triangle and the, um, and the ratios of the lengths uh, of, the, of the triangle will uh, be the same. So, okay, so you can see the diagram below uh, the world point uh, um, X in R3 is shown here. So I'll just um, show it to you. That's the, that's the world coordinate there. And what we're doing is we're trying to take an image of that. I'm only looking on one axis here. Uh, so, um, well, we can see the Y and the Z axis here is what, what we can see. So, so we've some point in the real world, which we'll call, um, we'll call Y there. Uh, and sorry, we'll call capital Y, I'll just capital Y. And that, um, that gets transformed into this here, which is uh, our, 
um, version of the which is our, our image of the Y and should have a little minus in front of it just so that we're we're being uh, consistent. Uh, so you'll notice here that it actually uh, it inverts the image and it'll invert it left for right as well. So on the X axis, it, it will also invert it when, when this happens. OK, um, so we, we look at maybe some of the numbers with regard to this. So um, one of the things that we have to make a decision on here is where are we going to put the origin? OK, so if we're going to assume that the camera is in some way the origin of the of the, the world coordinate system, uh, and therefore Z, the Z axis is going to be some distance out from the camera that we're trying to measure. Um, we need to decide where we're going to put the origin. Are we going to put the origin um, at the at the actual image sensor or are we going to put the origin at the pinhole? And if you're dealing with an actual camera, this is very much like having it at the sensor or having it at the front element of the lens, possibly at the back element of the lens, depending on, on, how, the, on how the lens is done or possibly at the aperture in the middle of the lens. So it becomes more complex when you you have a, a complex lens to deal with but for the moment as i say we're, we're sticking to something fairly simple here so in this case if we um if we put the uh origin at the camera sensor which is my green line here then i have my origin there and maybe you just use a, a different color here i'll use the color green here um the length Z that we're dealing with here, in other words, the length from the origin all the way to the position where the object that I'm, I'm photographing is at, that is the length Z. Okay, now it may look like Z is some different length here, but it's, it's that full length there. It's the length all the way from the origin. So in order to, to figure out, well, what's going to be the value of our, of our Y, which again, I'll just put a minus on there. Uh, what's going to be the value of our Y? And what's going to be the value of our X? Uh, obviously, we haven't shown X in this diagram, but uh, reasonable to assume that it's just the same idea. So what we can basically say is that the the um, sorry the the minus Y over the capital Y. In other words, what we're saying is that that line in ratio to that line is the same as this line here in ratio to this line here. Okay. Now, how do we find each of those lines? Well, um, maybe get rid of some of those so that we can continue to, to, to discuss them. Um, just put back in that minus. So when we deal with the, uh, the length of F, this is the length of F here, that line there, and it's going to have to be the same as the length of this line here. Now that line there is not Z, it's Z minus F because uh, Z is the full length from there to there. And that's why we have Z minus F on the bottom of the line. So what we're doing is we're comparing the ratios of these lines in such a way that we can um, try and determine what the value would be. Okay. Um, and then of course, once we have that, once we have the minus Y over the capital Y, we can find out what the minus Y is simply by manipulating the formula. So we end up with um, we end up with Y there uh, minus um, F capital Y over Z minus F. Okay, and we have the minus there simply because of the inversion that naturally takes place. We can do the exact same for the X there uh, and we end up with this. Okay. So that's what will happen or that's the set of formulas that we will get if we uh, use a pinhole camera and we assume that the origin is at the sensor. We can also decide to put the origin at the pinhole. And this is the example that I have here. So we have the exact same situation going on here, but now uh, while this is F, Z is actually only from there to there. Now this simplifies our formulas a little bit because now we just have F over Z being the same ratio as the minus Y over Y, okay? So again, just by manipulation of the formula, what we can say is that Y is equal to minus F capital Y over capital Z uh, in order to determine the, the, the where exactly that's going to turn up on the image. Now, of course, to know this, we need to know our capital Z's and we need to know our capital Y's and our capital X's here, um, which we normally don't know. We're normally working in the other direction. But to understand this, we first need to understand what would happen for an image and how would it get, uh, uh, what would happen in the real world if we photograph it and get that into the image. Okay. So 
You'll note that the image formed on the sensor is upside down. Uh, we don't show it, but uh, it, it shouldn't take too much imagination to see that it is also flipped left to right. So if I, if I was dealing with the, the X here, uh, I would have the same problem. This is, this is not a problem as we can easily flip these in software or we can just read off the sensor data upside down and backwards. You may have noticed that the front camera on your mobile phone, so for any of you that take selfies, uh, the front camera on the mobile phone, it, it usually does a flip. You can set it as a setting actually, but it normally does a flip. So if you normally see people who take selfies, you'll often see any writing that's in the, in the photograph will often be the wrong way around, okay? As if it's in a mirror. Um, and the reason for that is that people are used to seeing themselves in a mirror. So if, if they're taking a photo of themselves, this is how they expect it to behave. Okay, so when they're looking at the picture and so on, they expect it to behave that way and that's what makes it a little bit easier. Um, when that actually reads out as a photograph, that's generally a setting in the camera as to decide whether it's going to flip it back or not. And you can, you can make that decision yourself. Most people prefer their image in a mirror to their actual image. Um, so, uh, so the readout of a selfie camera can, it can actually be set to that as well, uh, ju just so that it'll give you a, a mirror image, image of yourself rather than the actual photograph of yourself, okay? So that, the only reason that I'm mentioning those is that what really, the, the inversions that take place, we can very easily deal with those, okay? In software, by just reading it out in a particular fashion or by flipping it. It's, it's, it's a rather trivial uh, thing in order to do that, okay? Um, However, from the maths point of view, it makes it a little bit more, more complex. So um, what we'd like to do is we'd like to think of it as, as upright. So it is worth noting that um, this, uh, this also happens in the human eye uh, and our brain does the flip, or at least we, we believe that it does the flip. Uh, but in actual fact, our brain just sees what it does and we react to it that way. And we've got used to what's up and what's down. Okay, we've, we've decided that that's how the, how the world works. But interestingly, uh, I don't know whether any of you have ever seen this, but um, I've seen experiments done on on, the, on documentaries where they've put this rather comical looking headset on people, which gives them a, an upside down view of the world. Okay, I can't remember if it was left or right as well, but it was certainly upside down. And um, it took the person about a day or two to get used to this. And once they were, they could cycle a bike, they could uh, prepare food, uh, and all sorts of things, even though the world was upside down. But at first they were making an absolute mess of the place. And it does just show you that the brain can very quickly um, learn to do that, that software fix that we talked about there that we would, ha we would have to do in software. The brain can also do that fix and can do it pretty quickly uh, in order to survive. So I just wanna hang on here, Niall is uh, asking a question here. I don't know, I, 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 I don't recall, Niall, if they actually said that or not, but I would assume it was a similar length of time or probably a little bit shorter given that they probably hadn't hadn't done it fully. Um, so I don't recall if they actually said that or not on, on the documentary, but I just I just found it quite interesting how quickly they could do it, yeah. Uh, but I assume that it's almost as quick to come back um, or probably even quicker. So um, going back to this, we can make our lives easier by pretending, and I mean pretend here because the image is not where, where we're putting it, right? But we can make our lives easier by pretending that the image plane is in front of the pinhole instead of behind it. The math still works except that the minus sign is removed. So what I've done here is I've moved my, um, I've moved that over to here and I've, inv I've, I've switched it around, but it's, it's, it's the same triangle. Um, I did my best to measure it out that it's, cl it's close to it because obviously with my rotation thing, it wasn't quite working for me. My first attempt was, was a bit of a disaster. Um, so it, it looks actually slightly bigger to me here, but I, I'm, I'm not sure whether it is or it isn't. In any case, it's, it's meant to be, okay? If, it, if it's wrong, it's simply my, di my diagram. So this, this uh, plus y is the same as this, this minus y, except that it's just uh, the, the other way around. So what we're now saying is that this is the pinhole of our camera and we're treating the image as if the image is in front of the camera instead of behind it. I can't remember who, so somebody asked last week about, um, you know, when we were talking about projecting from one plane onto another, 
did it matter um, which plane was in which position or something like that and this is exactly the same sort of an idea here that from the mathematics point of view it really makes no difference here except for the fact that this just makes uh, life a little bit easier and if we were to get this and do a software flip we would end up with exactly this sort of thing over here okay so uh, using the origin at the pinhole makes things easier on us and pretending that the image is actually in front of the camera instead of behind it also makes things easy as, uh, easy on us and the reason for that is that we have our um our length let me just take a, a different color here make it a different color other than purple uh, we'll use red um, so that length there is now F okay so it's F and we have that there and then Z is just the full um, the full length from here to here okay so you can see how we have one one triangle over the other we're just looking at the ratios so what we're basically saying is we're looking at that ratio compared to that ratio is the same as this full ratio here compared to the smaller ratio the, the smaller line okay so uh, what that basically means is that we have small y over capital Y equals F over Z. Now that's over capital Z. And that means that our Y coordinate um, is given by uh, the focal length times the um, capital Y over Z. Um, and X is given by the focal length times capital X over Z. And that will, will uh, calculate our numbers for us. Okay, so it's, it's greatly simplified the... Um, the formula is for us by by doing that so now this allows us to um to link to the idea we used for homogeneous coordinates uh, i just want to move my uh thing up a bit there if i can guys i see the bottom of it has disappeared off the, off the screen there for whatever reason anyway i can see it um there we are wasn't on my computer at all okay so this uh, this allows us to link to the idea we used for homogeneous coordinates um so our if you remember when I, when I drew that drawing for you about homogeneous coordinates uh, last week and i said you know how we how we move out from it that if we multiply it by any number out on the z-axis we still get the same coordinates because we divide in the, the z into the other ones so our image plane is at f which is the focal length the homogeneous plane can be anywhere, but by convention, we used, uh, we used z equal to 1. So if we had a, a world uh, point at x equal to 4, y equal to 5, and z equal to 3. Okay, and our focal length is uh, f equal to 2. And don't worry about units for the moment, we're just assuming it's 2 something, right? Um, so we normally have our, our uh, homogeneous plane at 1. Well, the first thing, to get the homogeneous coordinates, what do we do? Well, we divide across by 3. Okay, so if you remember this from last week, what we would do is we would get a homogeneous coordinate from this, which would be um, just 4 divided by 3 and 5 divided by 3. It would be our homogeneous coordinate, and that's what I've, I've shown there. Okay, and that, what that would do is that would move us back to, to some position. So this, this would be equivalent to... Um, Getting my uh, my little red uh, my red line here. Okay, so hopefully I've moved that. And just um, no, it didn't didn't pick up on it. Oh, it's not picking up on it because it's not drawn on it. Apologies. Um, all right, let's say I draw. I'll draw uh, an extra line here just to show it to you. Okay, so that line there. And what I'll do is I will just uh, select it. And what we're doing is we're moving it down to position 1 here, first of all. And in moving it down to position 1, what do we have to do? Well, we obviously have to take all this bit off the top here to bring it down to there. Okay. And what I'm then going to do is I'm then going to move it back. I'm going to move it back up to position F. And what do we have to do? We have to make it bigger again there. So it, it travels along this line here. In order to become what it what it's going to be okay so we divide 4 by 3 and 5 by 3 to give us that coordinate and if we project the image on the plane at z equal to 1 out as far as the focal length then and it really doesn't matter if the focal length is inside of that 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 makes no difference so if the focal length is a half this would also work so if z equals f equals 2 um then we just get the 2d coordinates um and we say uh 2 multiplied by 4 over 3 
and 2 multiplied by 5 over 3. So you can see how we've, we've uh, taken that into account there. So in the general case, we get the 2D image coordinates, and what we've done there is we've put the focal length there, which is our 2. We've put the length out on the z-axis, which is 3, and this is obviously the, um, the x and the y coordinates that, we're, that, that we have there. Okay, so you can see what's happened to um, to the thing. It's basically just our formulas that we have here uh, is what we've created out of that. Okay, the fx, the fy uh, uh, over z. Okay, so that's just bringing it back to those those that homogeneous coordinate idea there. So here's what we have to do in in general. We must go from the following. We must go from world coordinates, which are in three D. Okay, so world coordinates are in 3D, and we need to go to camera coordinates, which are also in 3D. All that's happened here is that we've got some world coordinate system, and we've got a point in it, and we, want to, we, we now want to see where is that relative to our camera. So that's still a 3D point. We then need to do our projective transformation, which makes a 2D coordinate. And what we then need to do is decide, well, okay, those 2D coordinates, what is their discrete pixel coordinate? Because, of course... Some will fall outside the sensor entirely, and those that fall inside the sensor, we need to decide, well, how big are the coordinates and where exactly do they fall? What is their position? And that means also that we need to decide, well, where is the two-dimensional origin? Uh, because previously we had it right in the dead center of the, um, of, of, the, of the image sensor, but in actual fact, in most image sensors, it's moved off to one of the corners. So what we do is we start with the vector in 3D and we change this to homogeneous coordinates in 4D. So we'll call this, uh, we'll call that our 3D point. We have our X, our Y, our Z, and uh, the one there. Transpose obviously means it's just it's a it's a it's a column uh, column vector. And this is relative to some world coordinate frame. Uh, it will be important to know or decide where uh, the origin of, uh, of the, the world coordinate frame is. So just something's after popping into my head there. Yeah, as I saw something earlier and it, uh, it, conf it confused me. Um, that should be a capital X and that should be a capital Y there for those rather than the small X and the small Y. So just be, be wary of that because it's these ones here that we were using. Sorry, that one and that one. I'll, I'll make that make that change anyway in the notes for later, but just you'll have to make it yourselves because uh, obviously you, you may not be looking at, uh, at those ones going up there. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is to transform this vector to a coordinate relative to the camera origin which we decided was either the pinhole or the center of the lens. So this requires the vector to undergo a rigid body uh, motion based on the extrinsic uh, parameters of the camera. So we have these two ideas which are called the ex uh, extrinsic parameters of the camera and the intrinsic parameters of the camera. So the extrinsic param parameters of the camera are generally related to where is it positioned and what's its orientation. Okay, so they'll be to do with translation and rotation uh, of the camera, of the camera uh, where it's positioned. Then the intrinsic parameters are to do with focal length and to do with the um, with the sensor type that we have. So what we want to do, firstly, as I say, is that we want to um, we want to change the coordinate frame from one that's in the uh, in the world coordinates to one that's in the camera coordinates. Um, and to do that, we have to do a rigid body motion, but it's effectively the same as just moving the origin from one position to another, bearing in mind that we might have to rotate the origin in some way um, so that the, the uh, axes are all pointing in the right direction, and we'll certainly have to translate it. So in effect, what we're doing is moving the 3D origin from the world to the pinhole of the camera, and all of the vectors must move relative to that. The rotation is because the axis of the origin at the camera may be different from the, the world frame because the camera is rotated in some way. Uh, it's perfectly reasonable to assume that the camera will be rotated in some way. So next we need to transform the 3D coordinate uh, to a 2D image coordinate. And this will require a change from 4D homogeneous to 3D homogeneous is what we're going to end up with uh, because obviously the 2D coordinates uh, are, would normally be in three, three dimensional uh, homogeneous. So we, we, uh, we will simply drop one dimension from the four dimensional and then we'll divide the first two coordinates by the third and multiply by the focal length. 
just like we did a few minutes ago. Now the warning here, dividing across by the third coordinate is a nonlinear operation. Okay, now that's problematic because we generally deal in linear algebra here and now we've thrown in a nonlinear operation into the middle of it and that can make a mess. So it's nothing we can't handle, but it makes a mess of our elegant linear algebra and we just need to be aware of it. So we try our best to try and get the nonlinearity off to the side until we look at it at the very end. So for this reason, we take it outside the equation and put it on the other side of the equals. It's denoted uh, below uh, in, a, in a slide or two's time as lambda, okay? But be aware that it's, it's a complex nonlinear thing, this lambda. Note that it is not the same as capital Z. It's not just the length out uh, on, the, um, on the Z, as that is the, that's the world coordinate that undergoes a lot of changes before it becomes the third coordinate of the final homogeneous image vector. So when you see it, don't, don't confuse it for Z or wonder why I've given it a different name. So the final thing we need to do is to change uh, the 2D coordinates to 2D discrete coordinates, um, which means, two which as I see there, uh, which means quantizing the space into pixels and usually means shifting the origin to one corner of the sensor. The most obvious choice being the top right uh, of the final image, which may mean the bottom left, okay? Um, sorry, when I say top right, it's actually top left I meant to say, top left. It's funny, it doesn't matter how many times I read through these notes, I'll still fi find these errors as I go through them in the, in the lecture. Um, so that would be the, 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 bottom, the, the bottom right uh, in terms of the image sensor in, inside in it. Um, so that's, that's normally where uh, we would deal with images, but it really depends on the manufacturer as regards wh what they decide is, is the origin. The focal length and the scale factors for the pixels in both X and Y are referred to as the intrinsic uh, camera parameters. So you'll see them here, so don't be worried about the wall of maths. There's, there's nothing, nothing crazy here at all. Um, what we have is, um, and just to mention by the way, that any distortions or differences from the pinhole model are also included under the heading of the camera intrinsic parameters, but may or may not be dealt with directly here and may be modified later in software. So if they were going to go in, they'd have to, they'd have to go in somewhere in this, um, in this matrix. So this, this matrix here may not be the full one that you would use for, um, for a, a camera matrix, but I've, I've decided to keep it to the most simple things to just describe uh, the process that's going on. So always remember the, the order in which things happen here, which an uh, order is important. What we have is we have a four dimensional homogeneous uh, coordinate here in X, Y, and Z. And we need to move it to the um, coordinate frame of the camera. So to do that, we use, we have our translations here and any of the rotations that we might need in order to move it into a position where we're now at the camera. This is, uh, the coordinate is now relative to the camera origin rather than some other origin. So this Z changes in the first case to, to a Z value, um, this, you know, or both the, or, or X, Y, and Z all change, um, probably, uh, possibly quite radically um, to, to wherever they're going. We then have this kind of, uh, which this looks a little bit pointless, but the idea is we have an identity matrix here, but it's only got the three parts of the identity. So this is going to move us down to being a three by four matrix um, rather than being a four by four matrix, which is ready to deal with the, the situation of moving down to two dimensional homogeneous. What we then do is we, we scale that. Um, so this is, sorry, this, this one is some, sometimes called a, a generic projection matrix. Um, rather, you you. Um, or in order to put in those coordinates. And sometimes later on, you'll see in later lectures that we will ignore the Fs and assume that the Fs are all a value of one, which would basically be just an identity matrix. So you'll see us doing doing that, um, where we just have a one and a one and a one. Um, and those are in the situations where we make a decision to assume that the focal length is one and everything else must then be relative to that, okay? Now, finally, what we do is we, we do some translation of the X and the Y coordinates within the image. Uh, so that's given that, and it's given us OX and OY because it's saying we're moving the origin. And also, we, the pixels will usually be rectangular in shape, so they may be a different size on the, on the X than on the Y, and that's how we include it there. One other thing to mention is that sometimes there's another, another one just here, which I think is given as S theta, which is something to do with, it's, it's called a skew factor, and I'm not exactly certain what the effect is on, on the pixels, but I think it's generally to do with if the pixels are somewhat off rectangular, 
um, and there's some distortion in them, you can model that by putting that there again, okay? But again, you'd need to know maybe something about your camera in order to do that. So the intrinsic parameters are often put together into one matrix, which we'll call K, okay? K being the, the camera matrix, why it's not C, I don't know, but this is a kind of a convention that gets used. Um, and so what happens is that if you if you just take those two matrices there and multiply them by each other, um, you will get, uh, which we have, have done here, you'll get um, the focal length times uh, SX, uh, the focal length times SY, and then OX and OY are, are still left on their own. And this would generally be considered the intrinsic parameter matrix. Not taking into account any distortions that might be in a lens, this is only a, the, the pinhole model here. Now the camera intrinsic and extrinsic parameters here again, um, we, we've I've I've kind of shown them here previously. We just sh we just showed this as being lambda x y one, and I said that that lambda was it's to do with the distance that we are from um, from the camera origin to uh, whatever it is that we're we're, we're measuring. Um, but it's a non-linear thing and we're going to have to deal with that later on. But we've brought it over that side in order to deal with that problem so that we can keep everything on the right-hand side here to being linear algebra. So we can also show this as just uh, the three by four matrix that we're going to end up with. Now, just to ensure that, that you can see why these things are, we've got a, a over on the, maybe just pick a different color. So this one here, uh, that is a um, four by one. But it's multiplied by a four by four, so we're going to end up with a four by a four by four, okay? Um, because oh, sorry, we, we we would end we would end up with a um, what would we end up with there actually if we did that? So this is a four by four, and this is a four by one. So the two of those actually would give you a four by one. This one then is a three by four. So if we if we take that uh, three by four by four by one, what will that give us? Um, that will give us a three three by one in its entirety. Okay, a three by one, uh, and then each one of these will be a three by three, which will give you a three by one and another three by three, which will give you a three a three by one, which is what we have um, over on this side. It's what we have over on that side. But if we ignore um, if we ignore this this part over here for the moment. And we just consider uh, everything to the left of that. Then what we would have in the end here is this three by this by this four. Okay, so that three by that four, we would end up with a three by four matrix. So what we can do here is we can show this those those lot as a three by four matrix, and this is the overall matrix of everything, including the intrinsic and ex extrinsic uh, parameters, and exactly everything that is going to happen to our image uh, when, when it comes in. So we can describe this then as um, lambda x, y, um, and the one for the homogeneous uh, is m times that three by four matrix times the um, four by one uh, ma um, vector, which is the, uh, the homogeneous coordinate in 3D. Now, to get from there, how do we deal with that lambda? Well, what we have to do is we have to do quite a, quite a bit of, uh, of changes because we, we took out that non-linearity out of there and we kind of have to move back into it. So we've just um, synopsized that here by saying that what you would get is you would get this matrix here, okay? Uh, sorry, that, that row vector there and this row vector here, okay? So that's that one there and that one there. Divide one, or sorry, you, you, you get that one by the four by one matrix. So I'll just show that as, as, as follows, right? So M11, M12, M13, and M14. And you would multiply that by your X, Y, um, Z coordinate. Okay. Um, Sorry, it's X, Y, Z, and 1. Y, Z, and 1, like that. Okay. Um, and what you then have to do is you'll get a result for that, and you have to divide that by the M3 uh, matrix, which is the, then going to be that, this one, uh, well, I'll just, I won't write it out again, but this, this one here multiplied by that as well. 
and divide one into the other in order to get your final result of what you're going to get here. Okay, so there's a li there's a little bit uh, in into that in 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 the final uh, part of it, but the reason that we leave that to the end is so that we can keep all of this other idea here as all being nice linear algebra that we can deal with and we deal with that non-linearity then as the last thing and that's why it gets a little a little complex at the last okay so that's um that's how we get that and obviously our z is just a value of one because we've, we're assuming uh, homogeneous coordinates so bear in mind that this transforms only one world point okay so all of that just for one world point and there are an infinite number of world points. So also keep in mind that any 2D coordinate is the projection along the whole line in 3D. So all the way along lambda x, lambda y, all the way uh, and, and, and lambda. So whatever direction, and we kind of have that shown here. Um, this is the basically what we're talking about is all the way along this line there. It could be anywhere along that line uh, we will get the same answer we'll get the exact same coordinate so anywhere along this line will lead us to exactly that uh, that that coordinate there okay sorry i'm just trying to figure out where i was it was i was much further on okay um but only the so if you take all the points in the 3D world and you go along that line, well, only uh, only the closest object will appear in the image, and it will um, it will occlude all points behind it. Okay, so if we take for example my uh, my pencil here, okay, and I point that at the camera in just such a way, I'll maybe st try and stay off it here becomes just a single point uh, you can't see the rest of it because everything else has disappeared behind it so everything becomes the one so all of those points all along there you can't get to those so whatever the first the first point that has some reflectance of it that's that's going to be it okay um so the previous slides are useful um to aid our understanding of what happens and in particular to help us work back but it's actually working back is what we want Generally speaking, this is quite useful, obviously, for deciding where a 3D coordinate is going to end up inside a camera. But remember, our job is the opposite of that. We need to try and reconstruct the three-dimensional world having only got the information in the camera, which is a very different problem. Um, but it is important to see, firstly, how it goes in one direction so that we can then work our way back. So it's actually the matrix M and its decomposition that is of interest to us to try and work our way back from the image coordinates to the 3D world coordinates. Okay, so it's it's all about trying to figure out those values there um, from M1 up to M34, trying to figure out those values. If we can figure out those values, then we have some information about what all of the things that has happened to the, to the, the, um, the vector for it to get into the camera. And from there, we can start trying to break that down and figure out, well, okay, where is the camera positioned now in comparison to the, the rest of the world? Um, what are the camera parameters? And some of those we might know and some of them we may not. Uh, but we need to find those out firstly um, to figure out exactly where is the camera positioned. And from that, we then need to try and find out, well, what is the point in the, in, in the, in the 3D location uh, in the world? Okay, these are called um, by, by, by various names, but... Um, Structure is where we try and find out where something is positioned in the in the world, and motion then is determining well what happened to the camera or what occurred to it to get there. So we'll often call this structure and motion, um, and sometimes these things are called slam as well. For if any you come across slam, S L A M, yeah, some of you have. Okay, so I think it's 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 generally used in in robotics, but I think it uh, because the 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 three D um, or because uh, the the autonomous vehicle is a robot, um, you'll often hear the the word SLAM come up or the acronym SLAM come up. Uh, so it's it's simultaneous location and mapping uh, is 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 the way they call it, but it's effectively the same the same idea that uh, they they're, they're coming up with. I'll just hang on here. 
Yeah, auto autonomous cars definitely definitely use it because of an autonomous. It, it tends to it comes from two different um, structure in motion or or slam tend to be used um, by different communities. But because autonomous vehicles uh, generally in computer vision we'd call it structure mo uh, structure in motion. Um, but uh, because uh, autonomous vehicles are effectively a robot, uh, you'll see a lot of that that naming conventions come into it. Yeah, so. So you'll definitely see the word the, the, the term slam come up again. So the pinhole camera model um, is certainly a very good approximation, but as we know, most cameras use lenses to gather more light. How much do these differ from the pinhole model? So firstly, with a lens, not everything is in focus. So that's the first thing. Whereas with a pinhole, technically everything is in focus, okay? Um, but with a lens, that's not the case, and that, that causes certain problems for us. But secondly, there are all sorts of distortions that can affect the image. Now, I'm going to mention radial distortions here, but I recommend that any, um, any of you that is, is interested in lens distortions um, should look up maybe Mark Lavoie's Stanford uh, slides um, on the limitations of lenses, or there's a book by a guy called Eugene Hecht. Which is a, it's quite a heavy book, but it's, a, it's, it's really the Bible when it comes to optics. So Vin is asking, would um, would an autonomous vehicle have the comfort of having a reference point in regards to SLAM? Not not really. I mean, obviously, all the time you're going to be try, trying to do that. But um, what you what you're going to do from from the point of view of uh, of an autonomous vehicle is you're firstly going to have to decide, well, what is your world coordinate frame? And normally that would what you'll do is you'll you'll decide that your world coordinate frame is um, the, or the origin of it is maybe the, the, the first position of the car before it moves. Okay, so you know where you are maybe from some other information. You might have GPS coordinates and different things like that, and they might be useful. So sensor fusion and all that will come into that. Um, but from then on, you're trying to make determinations about where you're moving, and you have lots of different inputs. Um, c computer vision is only one of them. GPS is another. You've got maybe LiDAR, and you might have radar. And you're going to try and use all of those to try and give you an idea of um, where you're currently positioned. Now, within this course, we're going to deal with it as if we're just dealing with computer vision, as if we're just dealing with cameras. But a lot of the things that we'll come across where we say, well, if we only had a hint, um, we, could, we, we could maybe make some other further determination. For example, I mentioned to you about the scale problem, uh, which certainly exists. Um, you know, where, where we're not certain if something is, is just small or far away, okay, because it appears the same within the camera. Um, and there's, there's always going to be that issue there. You may be able to find, figure out some of those from like inertial sensors and so on to say, well, okay, how far has the car moved? Therefore, how big do we expect that to be? And so on to work from that. But unfortunately, no, we, we definitely don't have the comfort of, of reference points. Everything is, uh, all of these things are problems that we're going to have to solve um, rather than, the only way you would know a reference point is if you had a, car, a, a camera in a fixed location um, that wasn't really moving and then another one in another fixed location, which is um would be great to have but it's it's not going to work for us in terms of autonomous vehicles so back to uh the the radial distortion uh, i mentioned this here as this is a very large uh, has a very large effect on the image coordinates there are a lot of the other distortions like chromatic aberrations that well, some are called aberrations and some are called distortions um which are, are strictly different things but the um the the reason that i mentioned the the radial ones here is that the the radial distortions are have a real effect on the image coordinates so even though you do all your projections to a certain point you can then find out that your your um, pixel positions have moved to somewhere else so radial distortion is a distortion that has an effect that is related to the distance from the center of the lens in other words um, how far we are from the center of the lens determines how distorted we're going to be so this is most likely in lenses that uh, with a wide field of view i.e a very short focal length now I don't really discuss fisheye lenses uh, in this module, but you will find that there is an, uh, you know, if, if, if you re recall from um, the day when you were up in, I don't know, was it, was it November last year and uh, Jaguar Land Rover had a, a test vehicle up, um, the, the cameras that were used for seeing around the car, which just to, you, you know, to some extent can, can be used for maneuvering and so on, um, but normally only at, at, at low speeds, they would be fisheye lenses. They have a very, very short focal length and 
they have enormous distortions come into that and those distortions mean that you don't get straight lines so straight lines in the real world don't get mapped to straight lines in the image now that's quite problematic because um if you if you consider the that uh, projective transformations the only thing that we could rely on it preserving was straight lines and now we're saying that if you have a fisheye lens or a distorted lens, you could end up with those straight lines not even being preserved. Now, normally we try and deal with that by mapping everything back to where it should be. So if we know a lot about the fisheye lens, we can try and do a transformation on that to try and turn it back to as if it was a rectilinear image. Um, and by, by virtue of that, uh, come back to our straight lines. Because if we haven't got our straight lines, we don't have our projective transformation and we don't really have anything to work with from there. So the basic problem is that the rules of projective geometry are broken, i.e. the straightness of lines are not preserved if you've got these distortions. So an example here, um, so the example below, it's a synthetic radial distortion because there's a, there's a photograph I took here in, in DCU um, and it's the, the Marconi building. If any of you have, uh, have, have ever been to DCU, you might be familiar with it. And particular times of day, the, the, you know, the, the strong sunlight comes in and it forms these shadows that move about, uh, obviously, jo during the day. So you get this lovely perspective view. So this, uh, this image on the left here um, is the image that, was actually, that I've actually taken with the camera. And then the image on the, on the right is one that I've intentionally distorted to show you what... Um, radial distortion would look like simply because I don't I didn't actually have a lens there that has radial distortion that I could then show it to you so I've I've kind of worked the other way here where I've I've had to introduce the radial distortion in order to give you the demonstration of it so what we notice is that straight lines in the real world are now curved so you can see the situation here that they're they are curved but you can see that the further that we get from the center the more curved they become. So these lines down here, they're actually still quite straight, okay, due to the, the radial distortion. So the further we get out on the radius, the worse our distortion gets in every direction. So we can see a curve happening there, but maybe not so much down here, okay? So uh, we notice that the straight lines in the real world are curved in the image and that this curving becomes more pronounced the further we get from the center. So generally, it's advisable to correct images to rectilinear before they are used for fo fo photogrammetry uh, purposes. In other words, before we try and do measurements uh, on our photographs. There has been many decades of research into the best ways to correct for this. Uh, so there's no one uh, right methods. Some are parametric methods where they use a, just a small number of parameters in order to, uh, to correct for the distortion, um, with R being the distance from the center. Uh, this is called a parametric method as it uses a small number of parameters, A1 and A2. The other approaches use dense methods where the camera takes an image of a known grid. Uh, so we, we, you take an image of a grid that's, uh, that's rectilinear or oftentimes these might be a kind of a checkerboard pattern like a chessboard. Um, and uh, an appropriate transform is then made for, uh, for every pixel to make sure that every pixel moves into line so that we get back to rectilinear. Um, so that's a dense method because you require a, a number for every pixel, but this can be useful if each lens is likely to have unique distortions um, or if it's difficult to model it with some of the simpler methods. In the case where we do not know anything about the lens, but nonetheless we can, we can see that the image is distorted, we can try to find a line in the image that we would assume to be straight and attempt various mathematical models and parameters to see which uh, has the best effect. So what we're referring to there is, let's say I just give you the image here on the right, and I say there's been some distortion, but I tell you absolutely nothing about the lens or otherwise. Well, immediately you could say, well, I'm assuming that this, this here is a straight line. Now I'm assuming that that should have been a straight line. It normally would be in the real world. So from there, I can start making determinations about what the, the rest of the image should do. Um, so you could do that. Um, now what will happen in many cases in... Um, autonomous vehicles is that the the cameras that you use uh the same with mobile phone cameras and so on they're generally not very expensive lenses because you need to keep costs down so oftentimes it can be worth doing this as a software fix rather than going for um for a more perfect camera and you'll, you'll find that uh, is generally the case Okay, so guys, I think what we'll do is we'll take a break there for five minutes. The next lecture is slightly longer, so we'll maybe come back just in five minutes and um, and we'll 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 move on to our next section, which is on to on to lecture five.